Hello, everybody. I'm Kristen. Uh, let's see. I go here. So uh, I wanted to share some of the findings from um, a project that we're doing at Baylor College of Medicine and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, not too far from here, um, looking at ethical considerations for the translation of computer perception technologies into, uh, into clinical care. Um, I just also wanted to acknowledge my co-PIs, uh, Drs. Eric Storch and um, John Harrington. Um, and so they're doing a kind of sister study, um, developing AI tools to automatically detect, um, trying to automatically detect and classify patients uh, according to symptoms of anxiety and depression. And, um, and so this kind of approach kind of goes by a few different names, but digital phenotyping, um, some people call it affective computing, some people call it computational behavioral analysis, but essentially it entails using computer sensors, so cameras, microphones, to collect all kinds of granular behavioral data. Um, so things about you, you know voice, your gestures, uh, your facial expressions, interactional patterns. Um, so using you know tools both inside the clinic, like this tabletop sensor, which is what they're using in their study, as well as you know um, wearables and, and personal devices outside the clinic kind of to detect things in the wild, right? Um, and the idea is that you can make sense out of all this really granular behavioral data uh, by you know analyzing everything on the back end and by triangu triangulating these with what they call ecological momentary assessment. So basically asking people how they're feeling using apps and things like that. So you get people to say, I'm feeling like this, you know, at this particular interval. Um, and so, and of course they triangulate it as well with uh, cl you know validated clinical measures. So. Um, so, as you might imagine, one of the primary, you know, ethical considerations is privacy, right? So, one of the primary concerns raised by both in the literature, there's a quite, you know, the a growing literature on this, uh, but also from our, our research participants, they, they point out that privacy is a, is a concern because you're basically gathering lots and lots of continuous passive data. Um, that, you know, using kind of, well, gathering data that's potentially sensitive, especially, you know, in, in this particular population, some of these people have been diagnosed with disorders, some people had not. Um, and so a lot of this is happening just sort of in the background. It's hard for patients to really kind of appreciate all the types of things you know, the inferences that could possibly be made. Um, some of them don't have a good understanding of why it's being collected, where it's being stored, how it, you know, where it's being shared, what, it, what kind of kinds of downstream consequences there are. They suspect that there's something, you know, that can be done with it, but they're not entirely sure what, what that is. And so beyond these privacy concerns, there's like just the feeling also as well of being monitored. Um, and so that can be potentially disruptive, especially for particular types of populations. Adolescents in particular, the ones that we're talking to, they, they report feeling kind of self-conscious or they report feeling like, uh, you know, they're not quite sure what these technologies can reveal about their emotional states. They worry about maybe becoming fixated on how they're coming across, you know, who's going to see this on the other end. Um, and, and they wonder if what, you know, if they want to kind of control, some, not, not everybody, but some of them talk about wanting to control how their therapist sees them, um, how their parents, you know, the kind of information that the parents might see and then also sometimes they talk about wanting to mask kind of the uh they, they become more subconscious about uh, their masking their own emotions, so kind of like hiding it from themselves, you know. Um, and so depending on what kinds of feedback people are getting from these technologies through, you know, uh, notification. I have three minutes left? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so let me click through these. That, I'm yeah. so surprised. Okay, um, so there are these trade-offs, right? So we have to consider what kind of informational gains you're getting from these data. Um, that calculation is like likely to vary across different people. Um, what it does seem to be clear is that there's like burdens on on patients. Um, uh, so you want to try to minimize, you know, the degree to which you're disrupting people's lives with this, right? Physicians are very deeply aware of these privacy concerns. They really want to know how right these these kinds of uh, you know, what are the informational gains? What, how right are these computers? You know, how, how right are the conclusions, right? And so this isn't a comprehensive look at all the concerns and stuff, but uh, this is just to show that you the accuracy of these models is at the top of everybody's list. Um, and so, you know, I think this is a really important question because, you know, implementing these tools in healthcare without knowing and without demonstrating their validity obviously has, has uh, strong consequences that all of us are quite familiar with and have talked about. But 
And, but one of the problems of getting it right is that uh, you know, these supposedly objective indicators of disease and symptoms are, are dependent so much on, on knowing what's going on inside of a person. And so being able to count for the complexities and like lived experience and symptom expression, heterogeneity of symptom expression, um, how do you get them to account for context and like, you know, the fact that maybe people aren't going outside of their house because there's a, you know, neighborhood insecurity or there's a pandemic or there's something, you know, or maybe people aren't communicating as often or as frequently with their, their friends and, and peers because maybe there's a death in the family. So accounting for context is very, very hard. It's very, very hard to computationalize. And so anybody who's studied something like, you know, for example, suicide, just defining the context, you know, sometimes that looks that, that means looking at things that occur like 10 years prior, you know. So the context, defining computationally what that context is, it's very difficult. So I know that this is speaking to the choir, like all of us have already, you know, we know that these things make it more difficult, more challenging. And so the irony is that these kind of like these these kinds of objective tools that are still, you know, they're they're th the, the irony is that these, these tools that are intended to be objective are still very, very much reliant and dependent on insights into what's happening subjectively in contextual factors. And so is it true that all of these technologies are always going to be you know, tethered to subjective insights? Um, and so m maybe that's not true. Maybe they won't always be tethered to subjectivity. Maybe they're just going to keep getting better and better and better. And so we won't have to ask patients all the time, how are you feeling? What's your symptom experience? Because we know that the sometimes subjective self-reports are unreliable, which is the whole reason that we're trying to create these kinds of technologies in the first place, right? So, um, you know, but if you start to rely less and less, like if you start developing these technologies and improving them in such a way that you start to rely less and less on subjective self-report, is that something that we even really want? You know, and in some cases, I think, you know, we have to think about what is it, what are the jobs that we want these kinds of AI tools to be doing for us versus what are the types of things that we want to still, you know, have human-human interaction, even if the computer can do it better than we can. You know, um, and so that's a sort of I think what we need to start asking ourselves. And so just to end, I know I have like less than one minute. Just to end on kind of like a more philosophical note. I think you know I think it's good to have a healthy skepticism about where you know the capabilities of these technologies in the long run. But I also think it's probably safe to assume that they're just going to keep getting better and better in the long run. And then so I think in some ways accuracy might be. You know, focusing on performance capacities and things like that might be some, in some ways easier and then some of the harder questions that we're going to have to start asking, which is what kinds of role do we want these technologies to really be playing in clinical care and beyond that, of course, like in our lives, you know, what kinds of, you know, do we want them to become uh, in kind of entangled in the same way that social media has become entangled in our lives in ways that we didn't really predict, we didn't anticipate, we forced that we saw it coming, but we didn't really know how to do anything about it. And I think like with the, with, you know, large language models and with generative AI, AI I think, I think accuracy, performance capacities, trust, you know, explainability, interpreta interpretability, those are the types of things that are in some ways easier questions to ask once the let's just assume that these technologies are going to become so powerful and they are going to become accurate you know representations of how people are feeling we won't need to ask people so then what do we do you know and so that's sort of what i think is kind of going to become the new era of what we start tackling in, in ai ethics so thank you very much <laughs>